Hello again, everyone. It's Jan O'Brien bringing you the last lesson of the Real Estate Sales Builder Program in here in Module 12. And I want to tie it all together with what I'm calling the best practices to reduce your risk and liability. Yes, you are a business owner and owning a business, it does come with some risk and some liability. So if you follow these rules, tips, and strategies that I have been sharing with people for years and doing myself, I truly believe you can have a great plan here to avoid complaints. You can't always avoid complaints and problems, but you certainly can defend and prevail. And that's the key here. So let's start with the first one. Number one is develop and use standard procedures with everyone do not treat people differently think fair housing in fact review fair housing if you need a brush up on it treat everyone all prospects customers and clients honestly fairly and equally and this is so important that sometimes people feel they have been discriminated against and they really do have a case when it can be noticed that as something as simple as this there's been lawsuits on this somebody comes into a company, a real estate company, and the front desk admin doesn't offer water or coffee to every single person who comes in. That's a simple yet powerful example. I'll give you another example. Let's say that you're charging a fee to a client, so maybe the transaction fee as an example. You must do that with everyone. You can't selectively say, I'm not going to charge you, uh, you know, this fee, but I'm going to charge that person another fee. And I'm going to give you one more. Let's say that you want to adopt a security measures, a safety type thing that you do for anybody that you don't know. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that if you're going to do something like this, every person you go out to show properties to, you ask for a copy of the driver's license, you give a list of what you're going to go show and you hand that off to the front desk so they know where you are. You don't get to pick and choose and say, Hey, I don't know these folks. I'm a little bit uncomfortable, so I think I'm going to put this in as my safety measure. You don't get to pick and choose. It's, by the way, a great idea to do that for safety, but you do it with everyone, even people that you know. All right, everybody clear? That's it. Standard operating procedures for everyone. Treat everyone fairly. Number two, keep a communication log during your transaction. Record the notes, the conversations, the milestones. Put all this in your CRM or even a simple communication log is going to do. Good old fashioned piece of paper where you make the notes of on this date and time, this is what I said. But honestly, that needs to go in your CRM. That's what we're doing these days. CRM, foundation of your business, remember that. So when it's really important to keep better notes is when any kind of red flags are raised during a transaction or you encounter any challenges, it is particularly important to record any pertinent facts or events. If you're using a paperless transaction management system, one of the things that you need to do is scan and upload all your notes, emails, and correspondence into that uh, trusted place. Honestly, you should do that for yourself in your own Google Drive or whatever you're doing, as well as in your company's transaction management system. All right. Now, one of the challenges that we have in texting is, uh, is the issue with this next one. So use email to confirm conversations, verbal agreements, proof of delivery of copies of contracts, and even texts that you might be sending. So remember, a lot of times things happen verbally and we'll get into the middle of the transaction between the agents or the parties and you're, you're saying, okay, so you're going to do this or that. And then you do it in a text and things can go wrong in a transaction very quickly. So you must just memorialize conversations. And so if you go back and forth in a verbal conversation with someone, then what you'd want to do right away is go to an email and say to basically, I'm going, I, I want to confirm what we just talked about regarding how we're handling the problems uh, that we came across on the walkthrough. You agreed to do this, this, and this. My client's going to do this. That's what I'm talking about. You put everything in writing and then you have a paper trail for later. I'm going to be super honest with everybody right now from my experience. It is he or she with the best paper trail prevails most of the time. When there's a complaint filed or there's a problem and you're having to deal with it on the various levels that you'll have to deal with problems in this business, somebody filing a complaint ethically with the board, filing a complaint with your real estate governing entity, 
uh, or taking civil action against you. It's the paperwork, the documentation that's going to help you. So go overboard on this. Trust me, you'll thank me later. Now if your clients don't use email for some reason, then make sure that you've mailed copies of all the contracts and documents they sign. I have cases of agents who have been fined. A complaint was filed on something that, had, that was thrown out and they were fined because the client also, or the real estate division also discovered that, hey, the client never got a copy or proof. There's no proof that you gave them a copy of everything they signed. Well, for the most part, we have that now, right? Because we're using electronic signatures, there's a paper trail, you send it in an email. But again, if the client doesn't use email, then you need to have some proof. Get something saying that they received it, that they signed it, send it registered mail, do something to protect yourself, okay? And again, on the texting, uh, this is where I think it's important to either grab screenshots of that. If it's important, if it's in the middle of, of a, a tense situation or those red flags, as I mentioned, have been raised, which is telling you your gut's telling you things aren't right here, that's definitely when you need to be recording things uh, and taking it down. So maybe grab those screenshots and put it into a, a, an email or a document and you can use that later, okay? Or put, it, put the contents of what you texted or had the conversation into your, um, you know, an email so that you can have it, uh, you know, archived, if you will. So the next one, keep a record of your transaction, including all paperwork, emails, and correspondence. Now that's everything, not just the memorializing the conversations I just mentioned. I think it's super important that you have a complete file. Now you, what you turn into the broker is all the required documents for your state or province, but you have so many other things that you are, that you are corresponding with and it's basically all your emails. My recommendation, back all that up, have a complete copy for yourself in a cloud-based program like Dropbox, uh, Google Drive, or Evernote. And then also organize your folders in your email program. So you may have a master folder that says buyer, and sellers, buyers and sellers, and then within those folders are subfolders that are the names or the addresses of your transactions, and then just archive all the documents into there, and then later you can print them out and use them and, and upload them as well. You will be happy about that later, especially if there is a weird challenge that comes up a year later, and you're trying to reconstruct whatever the problem is, or somebody's complaining about something that happened in the house, and now they've gotten an attorney, and you know, there's some kind of a construction defect or some issue that the seller didn't disclose. And now an attorney for the, the buyer is naming everybody in a lawsuit. This is where the stress starts happening. And you won't be as, as stressed, you'll still be stressed, but not as stressed if you're able to reconstruct and, and back up conversations and things that you had, okay? All right, what's next? Rule of three, love this one. The rule of three states always recommend three of anything three vendors, three contractors, attorneys, lenders, home inspectors, home warranty companies, you get the idea. And here's why. People are gonna say, hey Jan, who should I use for a home inspector? And if you're constantly saying, hey, just use this guy, he's the best. What happens when something goes south and things go wrong? They start blaming you and it's going to be, well, I used your inspector, your home warranty company. And this is where you can separate yourself and reduce that risk by saying, you know what? I always recommend at least three. And the next level of this is to create a disclosure. Run this by your broker, your office manager, but create your own disclosure that says, my clients are consistently asking me for various vendors and services. These are people I have used in the past and found uh, and reviewed and used and found to be, you know, great businesses. You do your own homework, so put some kind of disclosure in there. So you're listing them, you're telling, you know, the contact information and so forth, but you're telling them, go do your own homework and you have them sign it. All right, now that later when somebody says, well, I used your lender or I used this or I used that, you're going to be able to pull out a document that you can actually use in court that's simply going to say, I do this with every one of my clients, Your Honor, or attorney for the other side, right? Uh, I do this and I, 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 people always ask me, I give them options and I recommend that they go do their homework and their due diligence. There you go. All right. Now I know we're all doing this. You're all helping people out, people that help you out. But again, we're talking about reducing your overall risk and liability. Number six is always recommend and explain the benefits of a home inspection and a home warranty to your clients. And then get a written waiver if they choose not to get one. As a broker, I am going to tell you this is so important and I almost feel like I wish you all would have about three pieces of proof that you told someone 
a buyer in particular, how important it was to get a home warranty and to get a home inspection that they waived it in the purchase agreement. Then there's another document. Most companies do have another document, a buyer disclosure where they're saying, yes, we're getting one or we're waiving it. That's going to help you. And you can even go further and either put it in writing to the client saying, I highly recommend. And at this time you are uh, deciding not to go forward with a home warranty or a home inspection. Those, that's going to help you later because this is the kind of calls I used to get as a broker. Hi, Jan. This is John and Mary over at 123 Apple Street. Your agent, Susie, sold us the money pit. And, and they just go on and start telling me about all the problems of the house that they bought. And it's, of course, my agent's fault. Now, of course, before I have these conversations with anybody, I would have talked to my agent and I would have already known the answers to these questions. So the, the thing I'm going to go back to the client on after I empathize and I understand how they're feeling is what I really want to be able to say is, congratulations, you're a homeowner. Of course, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to be able to do and what I need to be able to know as a broker that the agents have really done this particular thing I'm talking about here, number six, is that I'm hoping when I go into the file, I'm going to see two to three pieces of paper that talk about how important it was that you went over it with them and that they waived it. Because then I'm going to be able to say, well, I can see from the file here that my agent really went into great detail. As a matter of fact, she has a copy of the email she sent you about how important it is to get that. Was there a reason that you didn't do that right now? Because of course, after the fact is when everybody wants to go get a home inspection and start building a case, okay? Uh, so be aware of that. Always, always, I think I've driven that point home. Always a home warranty, always a home inspection. And then ultimately you're going to get it in writing a couple times if they choose not to. Number seven, disclose, don't diagnose. Okay, you are not an expert at everything. You are working on becoming an expert or perhaps if you've been in the business a while, you can call yourself an expert in real estate sales and marketing. That's what we're experts in. We're not attorneys. We are not plumbers. We don't understand what black mold is unless you have got some specific training or perhaps you are an expert in some of those other fields. So you're going to be the source of the source. Stay in your lane. Stay within your areas of expertise. Leave the analysis and the diagnosis, diagnosis of defects, issues, and other concerns to the right experts or contractors, okay? So you just be the source of the source and you get people, you help coordinate getting the answers. Uh, number eight, educate and set the proper expectations with your clients. So here's a couple examples. Make sure that you conduct a thorough seller and buyer interview a qualification with all your clients. Make sure you're going over things like what can happen with their earnest money or their deposit money and if, it, if, they can't, if the sale cancels. If you're talking short sales, make sure you go through the pros and cons with the buyer and the seller during a short sale as an example. Always talk about the current market conditions. Is it a buyer, seller, or balanced market? And what are the implications of that? Okay, so that's just always educating and setting the right expectations with every client, which is going to change based on what's happening in the market. Number nine, when you're working with buyers, make sure you really have a buyer who's ready, willing, and able to purchase. And you do all this through the consultation. It's going to be best for you for them, for all the parties involved as they're getting a loan, make sure they've started that loan approval process with a lender. You can't go forward and start working with someone if they're not qualified. That's, that's just really not even just wasting time, but it's, it's, it's potentially hurting other people out there that you've brought someone to buy a house when they really had no intention of buying a home. And if they're a cash buyer, of course, do they have proof of funds? So if that's working with a buyer, then let's do the same thing over in number 10 and working with a seller. Make sure you have a ready, willing, and able seller. Uh, you've got to have a, someone who really does want to sell their house and not just to see if they can fish and see what happens with the market and they're not really ever going to sell their home. You only know this by doing a thorough consultation and making sure that they really want to move forward with selling their home and they're realistic with pricing. If again, you're working with short sale sellers, there is a whole nother level of potential liability there. So you make sure that you are, are understanding and how to work with the lenders. If this is not your area, then refer short sales to someone else or get educated on it before you just start jumping in um, because you definitely could have some liability there. Number 11, use a transaction checklist or an action plan to stay on top of all the tasks and procedures that are required from before, during, and after. 
And we've given that to you here in this course, and that is the seller and the buyer BDA checklist, right? Take those. They're a base document for you to customize and revise and refine for the way you do your workflows for your area. Super important. Include any due diligence, uh, contingency deadlines. These are the things that you could have some liability with because you're responsible for managing all that. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of moving parts to closing a transaction successfully. I think you understand that, especially if you're newer, newer, going through this, this training program. I certainly hope we haven't scared you away from doing real estate. I know I haven't. This is just best practices. All right, that brings me to number 12 and a great way to finish off this entire real estate sales builder program, and that is to be communicating all the time with your clients. So I call this communicate, communicate, and one more time, communicate. Kind of like location, location, location for real estate. This will be one of the best ways for you to avoid any potential problems is if you have a clear, open path of communication that you stay on top of with all of your clients. Remember, you're the first one to share information and you're not playing catch up all the time. All of that is going to help you when you return your phone calls and texts and emails promptly, that you communicate even if there's nothing new to say. That's gonna help you create that five-star VIP customer experience that everyone is looking for, which will lead to you getting great reviews online and also having a client for life who then helps you build your business for as long as you wanna do this. Thank you everybody for tuning in and staying with us through these amazing 12 modules. We hope that you take action. You go back and revisit it as you need and work on different things, refine your business systems. Join Matt Emerson for the final Let's Get to Work and we'll see you in our next training program.